There have been rumors, a lot of rumors, about Apple working on their own cellular modems, and for years. They're mainly LTE right now, but 5G is on the horizon, and they're already specking out 6G, yeah, 6G, and beyond that. So it's a critical part of the hardware we all use every day, and Apple likes to control all of those critical parts. The rumors picked up recently when Apple settled with Qualcomm, the biggest modem maker in the game, and Intel, who'd been providing Apple with modems during the spat, announced they'd be getting out of the business entirely now that the other two had kissed and made up. But that's left Intel's modem portfolio up for grabs. And much like Apple once bought PA Semi, licensed ARM's IP, and began making custom A-series chipsets for iPhones and iPads, the rumor here is that Apple will buy that modem business, license Qualcomm IP, and begin making custom modems as well. To help me sort the facts from the wishful thinking, I've got Ben Beharin on the line, principal at Creative Strategies and founder of Tech Pinions. So, Hit subscribe, handshake that bell gizmo so you don't miss any future videos, and let's get right to it. I'm Rene Ritchie, and this is Vector. Ben Beharin, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for doing this. Yep, my pleasure. Always happy to be here. All right, so Ben, just before we get started, I wanted to ask you, there was this report, I'm going to use quote unquote report for it, going around about Apple loyalty rates. Um, and I always look at these things, they get tremendous coverage, but when you dive into the data, it's, there's, there's no data there. What was your take on that? Yeah, I mean, and that's like, again, that's just the reality of Apple, right? Negative news helps. I mean, there's a lot of writers out there, I'm not going to name names, that start off with a negative bias towards Apple when they produce. And those things do well because investors, you know, especially in the investor community, because investors are like always looking for that one nugget as to whether or not they should short the stock or be long. And so that's the reality, right, of the news cycle. And so something like that generates headlines when, again, it's it's disingenuous. And so smart smart people ask the right questions. Others fall for the FUD. But, I mean, I, I, again, you didn't cover it. I didn't even tweet about it because I was like, this is such a waste of space of time. I'm not going to say anything. Um, but the reality is, since we're talking about it, is that, no, we've seen no data and I have no research that indicates that their loyalty rates are dropping. China is a different story. It's not that their loyalty rates are do dropping. It's just that there's a buying freeze and there's dynamics there that are different. But across the board, U.S., parts of Europe, I mean, again, this is we're, we're not seeing users switch to Android. If anything, no one's switching anything anymore. Like they've made their bed in Android or iOS. And that we're seeing very little transition rates between customers at all because they're now just so stuck in each other's ecosystems. So uh, just to set the stage, Apple originally, if memory serves, they used Infineon modems, but then they switched over to Qualcomm. Was it when they went to Verizon? Yeah, it was part of the Verizon deal. And then obviously they used Qualcomm until they switched to Intel. And Intel in the meantime bought Infineon. And so they started using the same base technology. And how, how did the two technologies compare? Well, it was always, I mean, I think Qualcomm has always had a leadership position in modems. I mean, I don't think anybody that, that deeply digs into the technology specs would, would disagree with that. Um, obviously, you know, when you look at the history of the industry, Qualcomm's been the leader. They have the most patents. If you're an engineer wanting to go into wireless and modem, you go work at Qualcomm. Like, that's the that's the dream. So, um, you know, they lead in network transitions. Obviously, they've been at the forefront of every time we move to a new G. Um, so I think, you know, undoubtedly, they've been they've been the standard for just quality modems on a, for a lot of different reasons, but um, it's also a very, very tricky business. Now, Infineon didn't have bad stuff. When Intel picked that up, you know, their goal was really, honestly, when they started getting into this, was more because they wanted to bring connectivity to laptops and things like that than it really was just smartphones. And then if you kind of read the tea leaves between those deals, Apple wanted to dual source. They started really heavily investing with Intel on modems. So in some degree, they had a lot of hands-on with Intel's modem development, which then led to you know the more the more exclusive deals that they had um, with Intel. But yeah, it's, it was all based on Infineon IP. Uh, and again, there's not a lot of people with IP if you want to make a modem, right? Like, you don't yeah. just invent that. So Apple could not have done this without some IP to do their to do their own. Which, but I think the reality is. 
for them, you know, there's a handful of places you go to get a license, patent, or a product from in Modem, and you know, Infineon slash Intel was was one of those options. And so for a while, we had this uncomfortable period where Apple was really pushing back against Qualcomm's licensing model and trying not to use Qualcomm model, uh, modems when they didn't have to. For example, if they didn't have to support CDMA in a particular phone, they would try to use the Intel modem instead. And that all resulted in this huge lawsuit that was then settled. And now Apple has two licenses with Qualcomm, both for the modems and for the IP. Yeah, so they have a, a chipset deal. So the the details of that as a part of their agreement was a multi-year chipset deal. So interpret multi-year, <laughs> however you will, two years, three years, whatever. And then they have a six-year license to the Qualcomm portfolio of patents, which means Apple can take any of those that they want. It's a, it's a patent portfolio license. I mean, it doesn't even have to be to, to modem. It could be for camera. It could be for RF. I mean, you name it, right? So, um, so they have the chipset license, and then they have the the broader license to Qualcomm's portfolio, which is a longer deal, as it shows, as it seems, than to just the chipset deal. So is this why, because I remember even in the very beginning, you started talking about whether Apple would move in on Intel's IP, because Intel at the same time announced that they were getting out of the modem business, or at least the consumer side of the modem business. Yeah, I mean, I've been talking about this since 2014, because again, right, you looked at the, the tea leaves, Intel has one customer for their modem, yeah. one. Okay. So do you, as an Intel, keep investing in a business that's very expensive and engineer sourced for just one customer, or do you shed that business? And my belief was always that it just didn't make sense for Intel to be, in this case, the smartphone modem business. This is not to say that Intel shouldn't be in the modem business, because obviously if they want to bring LTE and 5G to tablets and notebooks and, and whatever. Um, but the smartphone side, they had one customer. And so that's where... It made, it made a hard business decision. And so obviously the likely person, if you liked Intel's IP, was Apple. And my conviction was they would absolutely try to acquire it if they felt that the IP was good enough. Because if they don't, then why, why move yeah. away from Qualcomm? Arguably, you know, it's cheaper to keep working with Qualcomm over the long haul, given the deal they got, and given that Qualcomm, I think, genuinely does have better technology than what Intel had. So unless they felt that, it was better that it was that it was quality enough that they could build upon it, start a foundation, and really start to invest in it. Then I then I didn't then I thought they would buy it. If they came to the conclusion that it was not good enough, then again, wh why move away from Qualcomm? So again, this is all reported. If it happens, then I think it, it really just signals that Apple knows they need it. They know they need it to do their own modem. And they did feel that the IP was compelling enough that it made it makes sense. And a billion dollars, if that's the deal, is really not a lot of money in, in Apple's you know scheme of things. So is there also a hybrid approach to this where maybe Intel by itself, even with Apple's help, couldn't become competitive with Qualcomm, or at least couldn't be competitive efficiently enough with Qualcomm, but Apple building off Intel's IP or the Infineon IP with the addition of the Qualcomm license can sort of round that out? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this was one of the questions that I got quite a bit. You know, what does it mean for Qualcomm? Um, again, I, I don't think that this is a net negative for Qualcomm because I do think that Apple still is going to need and want uh, a bit of their IP, particularly around 5G. I think one of the main issues that's become very clear was Intel just didn't really have a clean path to 5G. Um, you know, network transitions are really, really hard. So the first two, three, four years of moving to a new network technology, is just it's hard to build the devices. It's hard to build the modems. So it doesn't shock me that Intel was not going to be ready day one for 5G. Um, that being said, I think because of the relationship that they have, and, and obviously it's really not again, a billion dollars for IP plus what they're paying for a license for Qualcomm. Just again, that's just not a lot of money in, in the grand scheme of things for Apple. And if those are continuing licenses that make sense that they can bake into now their IP, because again, Qualcomm obviously licenses to competitors, right? They license to yeah. Samsung who makes modems. Um, to some degree, they license to Huawei, even though that's a sketchy situation because of what's going on in, in China. 
Um, so they do. So it's not uncommon for for Qualcomm to license standard essential patents to do modems to competitors. In this case, it's a customer who owns IP. This is not mm-hmm. that out of the ordinary, is what I'm saying. So absolutely, I, I can see this being a hybrid approach, and I think that's probably likely and smart. Because again, I think Apple's going to want cutting edge technology in this modem, and I think you're still going to have to get that from Qualcomm. So when Apple started getting into silicon, uh, you know, they bought PA Simi and they bought a bunch of companies, but they also hired a bunch of engineers and they ended up uh, using ARM reference designs, but then just getting an ARM IP license and going with their own custom silicon. Is that a path that you could see them taking similarly with modems? Yeah, I mean, I think no doubt they want to make their own modems. I mean, I think that that's been clear, not just from reports, but from the hiring. I mean, I think if you talk to anybody in the Silicon team, doing baseband has been a high priority, but it's also been a struggle. And again, it's one of those things that they would have needed a license from somebody else, whether it was Intel and or Qualcomm or, or whatnot. They needed that IP because the portfolio of patents for modems is just so well covered you're going to get that from somebody if you're, if you're going to get into that business. So so the reality is they've always wanted to do this. This is one part of the puzzle to do that. Um, but again, it makes a lot of sense, right? If you think about where they're going with computers that we wear on our wrists, on our faces, in our ears, like this is a, the, all of those things will require modems. And so for them to be able to control the design, miniaturize it, which I think they're mm-hmm. the, the leading standard at miniaturizing technology, and putting it into things like earbuds or things like smaller watch or, or glasses in the future, they need to do that themselves. I mean, that's the inevitable path to control the modem and all the silicon bits to design something that small. So they control their destiny yeah. at this point for baseband. And I think that's a good spot to be. But that doesn't mean that they don't need other partners and other technology to do it. At least they can now design this bit themselves. Yeah, that was going to be my next question is what advantage do they get out of doing this? Because as you mentioned, it could be less expensive just to use Qualcomm. But uh, we've seen Apple does like to control their destiny, but also doing things like building it into the SOC or doing uh, systems in package like for the watch, or maybe as the watch becomes more like the phone, the AirPods become more like the watch and all of that. It doesn't just take differentiation. Like it's nice to have differentiated modems, but it takes a lot of really purpose built technology. Yeah, and I think the point that I think remains is that, you know, to date, Apple has not shipped an integrated modem on any product, right? They ship their A-series processor, and then they ship what we just call a thin modem. And so the opportunity is to really bring that design onto the chip, which gives you greater efficiency, better battery life, oftentimes better performance. So there's benefits to bringing the chipset, the, the modem chipset, onto the SLC, and Apple has never done that. And so that's why I think there's this opportunity for them to design this whole complete solution, which includes the baseband, and and that will inevitably yield great results across every product. But but again, I think it's essential for wearables. Is is my broader point is that you yeah. would, they would have absolutely had to figure this out to make a path forward in wearables. But I know you know down the road it'll be exciting to see what benefits they get with you know a a a series processor in something like even watch or uh you know iphone ipad mac etc that does have an integrated modem because they will get benefits from that from a from a range of different things so what what do you think i know it's really hard to predict this kind of stuff but what do you see as a sort of a timeline for this they went from pa semi to the a4 uh to the a7 you know it took them several years half a decade maybe do you think we're looking at the same kind of timeline here no, I don't. Um, I think for 5G, it's going to take longer. So if we're thinking about a device that requires a 5G modem, I would say for the foreseeable future, that product's probably going to be a Qualcomm product. But remember, Apple's already been using this technology. They've got all of the expertise to make a LTE modem yeah. with Intel. So I could see them in a much shorter time horizon doing their own LTE based product in something like iPad, maybe even Mac, um, perhaps Apple Watch, which probably doesn't require right uh, uh, 5G. So there are things that are low hanging fruit for them to do this with in the next one to two years, absolutely. But I don't think it's going to be iPhone. I think again, the, the meta point is anything that's 5G based, I think still requires Qualcomm's chips for the foreseeable future out of this multi year chipset license. So a 5G Apple modem iPhone 
is a longer timeline, but other stuff can be a much shorter timeline for them to do their own thing. And do you think that Apple would, because we talked about wearables already, but you know, a lot of people would love to have integrated cellular service on a Mac and Apple hasn't done that. And we've heard about licensing fees maybe, or that yep. Mac OS just doesn't have the same low, like efficient networking that iOS has. But as Apple becomes a master of their own modem destiny, perhaps those calculations change too. Yes, especially if you think somewhere in their portfolio exists a opportunity for an ARM-based Mac, yeah. then that would be a great product that they could build because it could be a thicker chip. You know, it doesn't have to be as small, so they don't necessarily have to make it such a tiny chip. They can use more die space, which gives them performance, GPU, you know, all of the ancillary parts that they put on those chips, including space for a modem. So, um, so that could work. But again. The, the the broad point is that they've been doing this so much with Intel, they could absolutely put their own, even if it's a thin modem yeah. in iPad or in Mac, they could do this very, very quickly uh, with this Intel technology. What would be a little bit more interesting is um, ways that they can tie software and services architecture to this. Now, this is, again, just speculating, but obviously Apple, Apple feels like services is a big part of their business, services demand connectivity. And so as a part of those types of, of bigger sort of looming business opportunities, can they more efficiently tie those services to their... So for example, is vid could video be better, smoother, cleaner, whatever, right? Maybe there's some augmented reality benefits that they get in terms of performance and, and tying the connectivity to the system. Because that's... Apple is a master integrator. Like that's really what it comes down to. They integrate technology better than anyone and they and they have the foresight to plan roadmaps based on that integration, which is what they've done with CPU and GPU. You see all these developer tools like Metal, great stuff that takes advantage of their their proprietary architectures in silicon and software. So my meta point is can they do things like that around connectivity if they control that stack and maybe give us better services, better augmented reality because they're tying the architecture to the solution? So that's, to me, the speculative potential upside. <laughs> And looking further out, you know, the 5G, we've all seen the recent tests that people have been putting up of, you know, you walk one block in Chicago and the 5G disappears. So in terms of the 5G rollout meeting up with Apple's timeline, do you think they'll get there as 5G starts to become more common after that becomes more common as we start talking about 6G already? Well, I mean, I think if you look at the timelines for these things, right? Every time we shift to a new G, it takes roughly 10 years for us to consider it mature. That doesn't mean Apple's going to be there in 10 years. I think five years out from now, it will be what we would consider mature. You'll have critical mass of phones. Networking kinks will be worked up between millimeter wave, which is what gives you very short form bursts of energy versus the, the sub 600 and then a range of other frequencies that'll help balance that out so that you don't walk a block. You could be wherever you want and still get gigabit speed. So the next few years, we're going to go through some hurdles. Of, of 5G. So yes, great. Apple probably has a 5G iPhone next year. It's going to be great in spots. It's probably not going to be all the glory that it will be in four to five years. But yes, if you think if you think four to five years is perhaps your timeline for an Apple integrated 5G modem, then yes, I think these kinks will be worked out with 5G for, you know, in, in that four to five year time frame. So that meets up. So beyond obviously the big uh, Intel modem purchases, are there any other signs you're going to look for in terms of Apple going into the modem business? Yeah, RF, RF. I think they, if they need, so basically there's two companies for them. There's Corvo and Skyworks. Apple will probably use mm -hmm. Qualcomm's RF right off the bat for 5G just because that's really tricky stuff and it's going to work really good together. Um, but you, I do think you need to control some RF if you want to be in the modem business. So I would be watching for um, for an acquisition of someone like Skyworks or Corvo uh, if, 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 again, Apple does acquire Intel's business because RF is a key part of this, uh, as a key part of that solution that, again, it makes sense for them to control. Awesome. Ben, thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure, Rene. Anytime. You can follow him on Twitter at Ben Beharin and read all of his work at TechPinions. Now, however this plays out, Apple's gonna have to hack together a lot of tech to make it work. But I mean, look at what NASA did to get to the moon and back with just a fraction of today's technology. You can see the whole story in Hack the Moon, Unsung Heroes of Apollo on CuriosityStream. Founded by John Hendricks of Discovery Channel fame, CuriosityStream is the world's first streaming service to address our lifelong quest to learn, explore, to understand. 
And there's so much more there. Go to curiositystream.com slash vector for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series. And enter the promo code vector to start your membership completely free for the first 30 days. Thanks CuriosityStream and thanks to all of you for supporting the show. Apple's a really patient company. Their chipset team went from zero to industry leading in well under a decade. Now they're starting to do the same with an AI team. And when you look at the benefits of bringing radio technologies in house, alongside chipset and machine learning, the efficiencies and performance that become possible are, at least in my opinion, too great to ignore. So whether Apple buys Intel's modem business or not, I expect in well under a decade we'll be using iPhones, Apple Watches, and maybe much, much more with industry leading modems as well. But now I wanna know what you think. Hit like if you did, subscribe if you haven't already, and then hit up the comments and let me know. Should Apple get into the modem business? And if so, should they use Intel as a springboard to do it? Thank you so much for watching and see you next video.